but I just want to talk to you about the tip of the opportunity. <laughs> the tip of the opportunity that we have, right? right. Started thinking about the, uh, actually about the tip of the iceberg that sank the Titanic, but that's a whole different deal. That's a different tip. But we have a tip and an opportunity. Unfortunately, it's often difficult, but one of the reasons that we control our tongue is for good family health, right? Yeah. Makes for good relationships, right? We've all been there. We've all been down that road. And it's a continual reminder in our lives that we should continue to allow grace and mercy from Jesus Christ because that's what we'll see. He continually provides it to us, right? How hard is that, though? It is hard, is it not? It really is. But tonight, and this is the way I read the Bible, so if you get confused, I don't mean to, but we're going to do some Bible scripture flopping back and forth because that's the way my mind works. That's the way I read it. Uh, because I find it all to be intertwined. I started to say interwoven, but it's intertwined. It's a constant. It's a fabric. It's, it's a tapestry from God himself. Uh, so this morning we stayed in, in passages like Matthew 15. Uh, but tonight I want you to turn basically to 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 13 through 25. And we're not going to cover every one of those in detail, but that's the basic uh, passage. And this is... This is going to be, for some, this is going to be a tough passage of, 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 of Scripture, but it's called submission to government. Or another way I could ask this question is, um, how do we live in a pagan world? What's our responsibility? That word pagan often conjures up things like witchcraft, evil, things that are really dark, right? But do you realize that pagan means really anything outside of a Christian belief? Right, And it made me think about this uh, this afternoon as I was looking at these writings, thinking about the number of people that we passed today that, that I think really seriously like this point right down here behind Joe's house, there, there had to be literally 60 boats on that point this morning. I don't know what was going on. And I'm not being critical of those people there, but that is the world around us, right? That's the world all around us. And the question is, when you ask someone, they would probably more than likely say, oh, I'm a Christian, right? I'm a Christian. But we have no walk of a Christian. We don't look like a Christian. We don't follow Christ. We don't pray to Christ. We don't read his Bible. We don't attend his church. But we're Christians. You see, those can't go together, right? So our position is we're living in a pagan world. What's our responsibility? And Peter addresses that to us. So this morning, uh, I spoke to you. Just stay in First Peter. I'm going to roam around a little bit. But in Matthew 15... It, it, it clarified for us in Matthew 15, 18, that what comes from a person's mouth is what defiles us or defines us, right? The, the, the walk that we have with them. In James 3, 6, it said that the tongue is a fire, a world of sin. It defiles the whole body and sets a fire on the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell itself. That's how powerful the tongue can be, correct? And then later in James 3, 8, it says he warned us. He warned us that no person, no person, like I said this morning, this is not a DIY project. We can't bring our tongue under control. We bring it under control through Jesus Christ. Now, this makes sense as we get further into this because when you consider that we're living in a pagan world and our leaders are apparently lost, what can, only, what can you expect from the government? Nothing. <laughs> well, I was going for a little bit more than that. But we understand from what he said this morning, the things that come out of our body is what defiles us, the things that comes out of a godless leadership. And folks, we need to face the fact that our country is under the rule of a godless leadership. Very clearly, Very clearly right? So if you don't have, that was the whole point of the deal this morning, it wasn't talking about what necessarily like gossip or deceit or things that come from the tongue because of a, of a sick heart, but that if we want to change the heart, or that the only way good things can come out of our mouths is that if we change it with Jesus Christ. The only way this country has a chance to change is if we change the hearts of those in front of us. But to that, for the Christians, we can adopt an attitude that it's really not my responsibility, is it? Hmm. I don't agree with my government, right? But unfortunately, as we'll find here, we have a responsibility to be good citizens. I wish Joe was here because this always gets his blood boiling when we start paying taxes and all the things we're paying for, and yet you don't seem to have a vote on anything, right? We're just plowing money here. We'll put money over here. I, I don't, you know, or, or across the world, we just do things like that. 
So we realize that in order to tame it, we need to understand the source which it comes from. And in Matthew 15, 19, it says, for out of the heart, Matthew 15, 19, it says, for out of the heart came evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. And again, these are what define us. This is what defines us as a country. This is what defines a business anymore, right? I mean, wouldn't you like to have one of those, uh, uh, talk to a, a company anymore that really had your interest in heart? Right? That doesn't tell you what you need to do for them in order for you to get what you need from them, right? Very tricky world, isn't it? Here's our problems. Here's what you can do for me to get what we already sold you, right? We're very lost in that situation. But see, that's what the situation is. And we, that we, in that passage, that we would be his children, would be his chosen, and would be the body of Christ, correct? That's like I said this morning, sometime, somewhere, sometime in, in the future, he's coming back to reunite what he left here, which to complete him is us. Is that a scary thought for you? That you're that important to him. That, and that's another thing that we need to look at in the world today is not seeing ourselves through our eyes. This is all my self-worth. But really seeing ourselves through the eyes of Jesus Christ so you totally understand regardless of what we physically look like, our handicaps, financial is, is, uh, issues, or whatever we're dealing with, that we, as a body, as a, as a child of Christ, see us through him. You're tremendously valuable to him in being that vessel. Let me give you some scriptures. Uh, why do we need to control the tongue? How about learning how to be a good Christian in a pagan society? How about being a good citizen, not only to the world around us, but to our church family and to our friends. Peter 2, 13 and 14. Look there with me. I, you should have it open now. In 13 it says, Therefore submit, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or, or to the governors as to those who sent him by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the, the praise of those who do good. Submit yourself to what? government wow really really i'm supposed to put up with what's going on right now as a christian as we talked about i'm supposed to look into the face of our government regardless of whose brand is on it and say i'm supposed to be in submission to our government that's what he's telling us to do yeah i wish, like i said i wish joe was here so he could rumble on this one right there's others here that might be slightly anti-government right Slightly. But here's the ordinance. Here's the ordinance. Now, look at verse 15 with me. This is a tough one, but look at verse 15. For this is the will of God. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Here's the catch. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, that you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, y'all would agree with the last part? Now, what's that foolish? That foolish is talking about that part, right? They're blind. Mm-hmm. They can't see. They're not following Christ, right? When you look at the millions around us that aren't in churches or, at, in, or even pursuing Christ, that's what we're dealing with is the fact of the ignorance. It's not meant to mean stupid. It's meant to mean blind. They're ignorant of the light of the world. They're ignorant of what they say, right? Am I a Christian? Absolutely, I'm a Christian. Is America pagan? Oh, my gosh, no. We think of what country do we think being pagans? Hmm? Some, some without without uh, prejudice, some, some, some tribe in Africa or... Right? You know, some... So, we look at these things and we say, well, that's a pagan culture. And they're, worship, they're idol worshipers. I don't think you can get any more idols in front of you than you can in America today, right? Amen. I'm just saying. And that's what he's trying to tell us tonight, is not, not only being, a, uh, but is being responsible to the world around us. Uh, again, this is a very tough one. But if I go back to 1519, uh, Matthew 1519, it said, it was ruled by godless men and women. This, this is where our country is right now, right? Mm -hmm. What can we expect from our country? Murder, adultery, greed, sexual immorality, false testimonies, which is lying. Do we have any lying going on in our government today? Matter of fact, we've, we've, we've got it to the point now, we don't even know anything what close to the truth looks like out of a, I'm serious, right? I mean, we really don't anymore. So what am I saying? God's already set the expectations of what's on top of us, right?
But then at the same time, he says what? Be responsible to your government. Ooh, nasty feeling. Nasty feeling. But that's what he's telling us. Uh, how do we know that? Because again, as I told you in James 3, 8, no man can, t can tame the tongue. Uh, it's unruly and full of deadly poison. Until our leadership changes their hearts, uh, what are they on right now? Gun control again, mm -hmm. right? Huh. Do we have to get into all the things that we're killing in this country right now without getting into the detail to say that gun control is important, but it is not at the top of the list? Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you, it's all smoke and mirrors and facades, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing we have to look at. What can we expect from our government? You can't expect any more from an unsaved person, from a person that doesn't have the heart of God, than these things that Jesus already aligned for us. But yet he still keeps telling us to do what? Be a good citizen. I'm supposed to be a good citizen. I don't like this, right? That's why I say it's the tip of the opportunity. It's the tip of the opportunity. A godless government can, can produce nothing else but what we had in Proverbs 18, 21. Death or life. That's all it can produce. A godless leadership. Uh, without, a God, without a God heart, there's nothing more th uh, than evil. That's all there is. So I'm a Christian. So that relieves me of my responsibility to deal with with them or to be a good citizen, right? Hmm? I'm in my little world doing my little thing. No, that's the bad part. Why do we have to control the tongue? Because we are the representation of who? Jesus Christ. It is the burden that we accept when we accept Christ, right? It's what we accept from him. We accepted this idea. I thought I just accepted so I just got saved. That's all I got. Now you're telling me I have to be a good Christian? Yeah. That means the things that we don't like and the things that come to us, we have to deal with them. Can we use discernment? Yes. Can we use wisdom, Bible wisdom, knowledge? Yes. But at the same time, we have to be the person that is the light in the middle of the chaos, right? In 1 Peter 2.13, it answers to why. 13 and 14 I read to you, but in 15 again it said, For the will of God... That by doing good, you might put to silence the ignorance of a foolish man. And again, the foolish man, the ignorance, the lostness, the blindness. Do you remember the part this morning from Matthew? And I'm sorry, but this is the way I read the Bible. I go from, but in Matthew 15, 13, and 14, it said, Every plant which is not planted in God will be uprooted. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Is it not? Where's our world going, folks? This is why I say when we get up in the morning and you see the news, and by the way, I think Barbara and I was talking the other night, we haven't had a television in, I don't know, seven years now? Wow. I'm only saying this. I'm not saying we don't see movies and we don't have other, but we have managed to live without the news 24-7 yep. for seven years. It hasn't really changed our lives. I'm just going to continue to encourage you to limit what you're taking in, right? He wants to come to you with this chaos, this fear, this confusion. Let me break it to you. I've said this before. Ten out of ten of us are going to die before we get out of here. It's not seven out of ten, no matter what the religions tell you. It's, it's, and that's the sad part when I think about a pagan world that we're living in today is people think that there's some loophole going to happen at the end of their lives that's going to somehow miraculously change their lives. And without <laughs> salvation, without believing in Christ... There is no change without, what is that, believing in Christ? That is changing of the heart. I've got to change this thing out. It's filthy. It's loaded. That's the only way. And there's so many people that I really believe that they think they'll just keep pushing it. Or, in our world today, they don't even think about it at all. I'm sure in all of our lives there's been a point that God was not on the top of our list, right? That's why we don't have judgment. We have love, <laughs> compassion, those things, <coughs> grace, mercy, the same things as he allows us. Every plant which is not planted in God will be uprooted. God will take care of what he needs to take care of is what he's saying. If they're not in God, they won't be with us, will they? But it's in our place. But in 1 Peter 2.15, that point right there, that last sentence, to silence the foolish, to silence the foolish, this is the part in the Christian life when you need to see a Christ as Christ, that we need to, you need to see us, as I said earlier, you need to see yourself as Christ sees you. You are the light. You are the hope. You are the darkness. Sorry. In the darkness. In the darkness. I think my fog is still there tonight. 
But we are that Lord. We are the ones dealing with the facts of what is the government doing to us. But how are we responding in a Christian manner to be a testimony to the world around us? He says that in the ultimate end, we will silence the foolish. We will. But our daily walk every day is to remain in control. That's what we're talking about this morning. To tame the tongue is a touchy topic. To tame my tongue so that I don't overreact or I don't argue against things that I know are already stupid, right? It doesn't mean we just lay down and go, oh. But to some degree, it also means that we stand up in our Christianity and we remind ourselves that we are that light. We're that witness. We're the only one left. We are the ones that say, no, Rebus, that doesn't make any sense. But you have to remember, again, what I said earlier, a godless leadership, they're not talking the same language, folks. They're not going to understand the same language. That's why we have to continue to introduce kindness to them and love and caring as much as it hurts. Um, but see, in this case, your value to the world. Your value to the world because you're a, a, a child of God is invaluable to the world. They don't, can't see that. They may not totally believe it. But it's a fact of every issue, every age in this room, every place that you go, everywhere is that we stand, whatever our witness is, it's way beyond just our families because it is who you are in him. You reflect everything. You define your God, your church, and your love of him by who you are and how you react. So it is right on the tip of your tongue all the time. <clears throat> Challenging you as Peter's challenging us here. First Peter 2.15, for this is the will of God. Uh-oh. For this is the will of God. That by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of the foolish man. That by doing good, I need to be a good citizen. Wow. That's a tough one, is it not? Huh? How many people are going to sign up tonight to be a good citizen for the government? Yeah, right. I'll see your hand up. <coughs> But going to verse uh, uh, 1 Peter 2.18. Look at this one, 2.18. Let me finish out that, though. I want to read this to you. Uh, 2.16 says, As free, yet not uh, using liberty as a cloak for a vice. But as bondservants of God, honor all people. Love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. You see, we struggle with this a lot, not only in our uh, position, but Revis and I were talking about this this week. Many of you in this room are committed. You're here tonight. You, you volunteer for many things over the years. You've given many, many hours of your time and to the church or church activities. And there are others that aren't here tonight, but I'm just saying we, we feel that. Some, but sometimes you just feel like, wow, it's just a constant outflow of what I give, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, it is. You see, it is. It's a fact of the matter. But your relationship and your, your ministry, as I keep telling y'all, is between you and Jesus Christ. It's what you're doing with him for him. Collectively, we're in this room. Collectively, we're all together. But individually, it's what I'm doing for my God. And that is what you have to hold on to. Because sometimes, like I said, I've been saying this since I got here. If you take the blinders off and look around, you'll quickly find what? Look at the load I'm carrying, right? Look at what I'm doing. Because Satan wants to come to us in that way, doesn't he? Yep. Why don't you just drop back and let it go? Don't worry about it. Because your value is to God himself. That's what it says right here. Honor the king. I made that relationship with him. Be exhorted in this. Be encouraged in this. Strengthen yourselves in these words tonight. You are honoring the king himself. That is the relationship you have with him. That's the beauty of that relationship. In verse 18, it says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Be submissive to your masters with all fear. That fear word is a reference to be reverence. The reason this passage is in here is because this was initially written for the Jews, correct? And the Jews believed what? They were the seed of Abraham. And because of the seed of Abraham, they were what? They were above everything else, right? They're definitely above the Gentiles. They're definitely above, it, right? So that's why he said in this, servants, be submissive to your masters in fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is the commendable, if being uh, because of conscience toward God, one endures grief. Suffering wrongful and wrongfully, suffering wrongfully, excuse me. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is the command, commandable, commendable before God. 
Wow, he's talking about physical pain right here, folks. This is not spiritual analogies right here. In this time when this is written, he is talking about the physical whippings that these Christians were taking, and some still take in our world today that we're so blessed not to be experiencing right now for our stance. But this is that level. The reverence to our government to be implied there, to be servants. Wow. Servants in the fear of really of a lost government. How hard is that? Hmm? How hard is that? How hard is it to know how the story is written, how the story ends, and the foolishness that's going on in man attempting to save man? What was they talking about last week? Generating another $2.5 billion? Just keep generating, folks. Ultimately, paper will not be worth anything, and it will break, right? I don't know the comments. We're not that stupid, right? But that's our solution to it. But in us is all hope of the world. If you don't stand up in God and let your life be the witness, then there is no other hope. There is nothing else to hold on to. Regardless of the stress or pain uh, induced as we watch the destruction of America and the attack on the Holy Bible. Do you notice we don't hear too much about the Bible in the news anymore? But do you realize that it's because everything that's underlining the subtleness of that is about the Holy God Bible? That's right. Everything. We just don't use that word. Why? Because they know to say the Holy Bible. Oh, well, the Christians will get excited about that one, right? We'll get letters and emails. Mm -hmm. But if we can quietly tuck it into a bill, change the verbiage on how we uh, change bills, the names on them that we're helping, you know, like some of our new ones where we're going to mix all the kids together now, or no one knows what they are until they decide what they are. We don't use the word homosexuality, immorality. We don't use those words, right? They're different now. Why? Because we don't want to say those type words because we know what few Christians are still standing. That'll upset them, right? So we hide it away. We tuck it away. That's this issue that we're dealing with with the lost deal. But we still have this commission. We still have this commission to be submissive as servants, to be good citizens to our government. And our government could also mean to our community, to our schools, right? To the civil world around us. Difficult situation. There, Brenda's got her arms crossed. She's not buying this, I'm telling you. <laughs> we ought to, regardless of what we, we ought to continue to do good. For in the face of aggression is humility. In the, in, the, in the face of what we're dealing with is the constant reminder that God is in control, that God is in charge. Uh, I think of Saul before Paul or Paul after Saul. Can you imagine a man that was raised as a soldier? He was, he was raised to be a soldier, right? This man was a man-man, right? I mean, that's all I can think about him. He rode a horse. He had a sword. He was chasing, persecuting, killing Christians. He was a man. Now think about after salvation. This is that transition, a perfect example of what happens after I change the heart. Can you imagine Paul still talking to these same men, this same government, knowing what he knew that they, once he was one of them, right? And now they're beating him with rods and whips and sticks and imprisoning. Do you understand the change of heart required? That that word servant is truly what he was, right? So well, he was a special man. I do believe he was a special man. But God told us in the, in the very beginning that he would suffer for his name, and he did, did he not? But isn't that what we signed on for? It's embarrassing. We're not dealing with, like I said a couple of Sundays ago, we're not dealing with the threat of physical pain at this point. We may just be dealing with some embarrassment. I was thinking about if they came to you and said, hey, hey, uh, what's your viewpoint on American government? And you started quoting Bible to them or you started taking, how quickly would they go to your past? Oh, wow. Really, Brother Tim? Let's talk about this. How about this? Wouldn't they? Isn't that what they do? Oh, they would attack. Oh, you're so high and holy, right? What about this and this and this and all the things that we have in our life? And how is it to be able to stand there and say, you're absolutely correct, but I'm forgiven under the blood of Jesus Christ? Because that's the only thing that saves me, right? That's right. The beauty of the blood washed in the blood. And you want to look, you know, those, those ladies with the microphones and all the makeup, you want to look at the thing that goes over their head? It would go right over their head, wouldn't it? Hmm? Lostness. They're lost in the world that we have today. And Peter, uh, we read 1920. For 21, for here, here, here comes the, the, good, the good stuff. Um, verse 21. For to us you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 
Hard to argue, folks. Hard to argue. Look at verse 22. Who committed no sin. He wasn't even a sinner. I mean, at least we have reason. I can look at my past and say, you know, at least I can see what I'm unworthy of, right? But here is a, a God, a man that came here and bore our sins. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his. And what's that last word there? Mouth. See, he had no hatred, no ugliness. What a perfection not to have that in our vocabulary, right? Not to have that in our hearts because it's still there, right? Step on my toe just right. It might jump out, right? It does. He says to us right here, for the same example he gave us, this is the burden that we carry. This is why I'm a good example, uh, again, to, to the world around me. Verse 23, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. And when he was suffered, he did not threaten, but committed, to, committed himself to him, to him who judges righteously. In other words, he committed himself to Jesus Christ, did he not? Mm -hmm. That's the question tonight. If you're looking at your walk, are you committed to Jesus Christ? Right? I mean, truly committed. Seeing past what this physical level is. This is the battle of, 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 of our life right here. Being able to see above my circumstances. Being able to see above what my life is here to realize that I have a better life forthcoming. I am more valuable to him than anything I'm here. Right? No matter what I've been told. I was thinking about the tongue this morning. The things that we live with in our lives. Child abuse. Wife abuse. Spouse abuse. Verbal abuse. <coughs> it, it's really real, right? There's real scars involved in some of this. Some of it is very scarring. And I know uh, from reading books that psychiatrists and others tell us to what? you got to forgive it. you got to forgive it. But Jesus Christ was the first one to tell us, John, you got to forgive it. Why? you got to let it go. You can't live with it. You can't carry it. You can't carry all this around with you because your heart, in order for this to come out to be defining to Jesus Christ, to show who I am, I've got to let what's in here go. It is of no value. This is why he went to the cross. This is why he bore what we did. Look at 24. He himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by those whose stripes were healed. I haven't been beaten yet. I hope I never get there. I'm not into pain. You know what I mean? Slap me, I'll cry. I, I, don't, I don't like pain. It hurts. I watch those movies, right, where the guys get beat up and all that stuff. I get a splinter in my finger, I'm down. I'm like, you know, 911. I need, I, need some, I need some help. No, it says right here, he bore our sins. He set the example by those whose stripes you were healed by. This is what he did for us. Why am I a good citizen for my country? Why do I deal with my government? I'm commended by God. So when they come to you and they say, well, are you Republican or Democrat? I don't really know anymore. But one thing I can answer, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. And that is my strength, right? And that is my rock. And that is my resolve. This is how I read the Bible. It all intermixes together. He tells us why my heart is broken. He tells me how to heal it. And then he tells me here what to use it for. This is the beauty of the Bible when we strengthen ourselves in it. And when they come to us again and as we stand there boldly, boldly, I'm a child of God. <coughs> what if we do get to the point in the tribulation that you do have to wear the mark of the beast? Now I'm getting into some weird stuff here. I don't want to scare anybody because I had a lot of people ask me, oh, wow, is it in the shot? Is it in the vaccination? Folks, if they want to know who you are, they already know who you are. And then I got tickled. Please don't take this the wrong way. Why are they tracking me in the first place? I'm just not that important. I mean, I'm sorry, but people have asked me. Oh, I said, I'm thinking, you know, let them track me. Uh, you know, maybe they can, they'll learn something good. Maybe they'll send an agenda. I don't know. Maybe they can. I, don't, I really don't. But my point to it is, some point, someday, do you have that strength to stand up and say, I am a Christian beyond everything else? Because that point of time may come to us when we have to make that decision. Am I truly a Christian? Do I believe in God? Remember that question I asked earlier. If you walk up to most people outside this building, they say what? Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I, do you ever go to church? Do you ever give anything? Do you ever, do you ever give anything to even the, 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 your, your community? Do you give anything back? No. And what is it that you believe in? 
because most of us would have to honestly answer what I believe in at that point in my life is I believe in me, right? Because that's really what we're saying. I believe in me. Again, John 3, 8 said, no man can tame the tongue without the assistance of Jesus. In Ephesians 4, 30, 4 32, it said, and to be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgoing one another, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Even as God in Christ forgave you. When I take Ephesians 4, 32 and I overlay it or underlay it with 1 Peter 25, it says, for you were like sheep going astray. But now... But have now returned to your shepherd and overseer of your souls. You belong to him. You belong to him. Your commitment to Christ and your commission to the world are both right on the tip of your tongue. Because it is how we respond to the things that come at us in this world. Do we first consider, this is me, John, when your boat went upside down, that was probably on the tip of your tongue, right? Hmm? We get bombarded by these physical things, these, these worries, these cares of this world. They burden us down. This is that point. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to step back and say, I'm sorry. Let me, let me get back in my God, and then I'll deal with this. I'll deal with my being a caretaker. I'll deal with the issues of my homes. I'll deal with the issues that I have around me. But first, I have to put my heart back in Jesus Christ because what comes out, if it comes out vile, wicked, and ugly, I'm going to destroy more than I help. That's right. I need to be a good citizen. A good citizen in Christ. Why? Because Brother Tim said so. Please don't. Uh -uh. I'm not that worthy. Honestly. Because my Sunday school teacher said so. Because the government said so. You don't probably want to hear that from them. No. Because of what he said right here. Because I need to be bound to my God. I need to honor my God. That's, that's the value that you have. It's not... I, I don't have words. It's not that God is over there or God is over there and you're here. God is right here. This is your God. This is your Jesus Christ. He lives in the Holy Spirit right here. He's right here with you. It's not an estranged relationship. It's not a long-distance relationship. You and him are together, and he supplies every one of us with that commitment every day. It's just a question of whether or not we call on his name. Amen. It's right on the tip of your tongue. The opportunity to show your Christianity is not only your response, it's your responsibility. It's a gift. The question is, can you truly show it? In that moment, when everything is going wrong, can you really show it? That is our commission. Amen? Amen.